It's really nice to see you back again. Well, I had a lot of fun and some excitement. But I've been away far too long, and I'm happy to be home. And alive to tell the tale. And you're just the man who can tell one. <laughs> but you're not home yet. Paris isn't London. Well, it's closer than Singapore or Batavia. Did you find some new stories? Mm-hmm. Met some new people. Learned to be more tolerant of them. I was encouraged by the goodness of my fellows and not too distressed with their badness. You know, Laura, I found there's not so much difference between the good and the bad as the moralists would have us believe. My, you have come back mellow. What does it feel like to be famous? I've been asked that question before, and I've never quite known how to... how to... Excuse me, Laura. Uh, we were saying... No, I don't blame you. She's very attractive. Yes, yeah, she's more attractive than ever. You know her? I knew her in London, yes. She was Mrs. Livingston's governess. Governess? Oh, impossible. This completely changes my ideas about governesses. Well, a great deal can happen in a couple of years. And with Joan Robinson, a great deal happens in one evening. And, of course, you were there? As a matter of fact, I happen to be there. You usually do. It was one of Edith Livingston's brassy dinner parties. She made it impossible to refuse her, but I didn't flatter myself she wanted me for myself alone. She simply needed an audience for her guest of honor, who on this occasion happened to be Count Borselli, one of the world's leading authorities on precious jewels. How Edith got her claws on him, I never knew. <laughs> I'm not sure he did either. But I must say, I had presence of mind in the emergency, and after all, she's fairly presentable, poor thing. She's over there by the fireplace. Oh, lovely. Oh, very generous of you. Well, we needn't worry about Miss Robinson. I've given her precise instructions on her conduct tonight, and I've put her next to Colonel Morney. You know, he's stone deaf, so... Oh, the Count's here. Count Bocelli. Mrs. Livingston. Mr. and Mrs. Lancaster. And, oh, Mrs. Chauncey Bodine and Alex Hughes. How do you do? Colonel Morney and Mrs. Harris. Count Bocelli. Shelley, Shelley. Never read him. Kipling's more my taste. By the old moon mine pagoda looking lazy at the sea. There's a Burma girl that's set So up. pretty, darling. You must remember to tell us the rest later. Hmm? Oh, yes. Uh, this is Miss Robinson, our governess. She's filling in for a guest who became ill at the last moment. Aren't you, dear? Miss Robinson. How do you do? Count Borselli, if you please. Stella, this is Count Borselli, Mrs. Charlton. Delighted to meet you, Count. Delighted to meet you, Mrs. Charlton. And Peter Jeffries. Count Borselli. That's your governess over there, isn't it, Edith? Sweet of you to have her to the party. It's so refreshing to meet all kinds of people, I always say. Thank you, dear. One does one's best. Lydia couldn't come, you know. She's a mouse of a thing, isn't she? Rather a pretty mouse, I'd say. Such a depressing middle-class gentility about governesses, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, maybe so. But if that lady represents middle-class gentility, it is interesting that she should be the one to wear a string of pearls worth at least 50,000 pounds. 50,000? Oh, but of course, you're joking, Count. Did you say 50,000 pounds? Oh, but there must be some mistake. I mean, oh, I know you should know if anybody does, but it's impossible. Forgive me for saying this, but are you sure? Well, how can one be sure of anything in this uncertain and capricious world? I beg your pardon, Miss Robinson. Uh, may I examine your pearls more closely? Why, yes, yes, of course. You are right, Mrs. Livingston. I was mistaken. I felt sure that you must have been. I said they were worth 50,000 pounds. They are worth at least 60. What? Uh, Miss Robinson, where did those pearls come from? Well, I, I, I don't remember where I bought them, Mrs. Livingston, but I assure you I, I didn't pay 60,000 pounds for them. I've not seen pearls like those since I appraised the Duchess of Melford's 10 years ago. They are not only perfectly matched, but very, very old. But I don't understand. I mean, they couldn't be. Oh, Miss Robinson, Count Borselli ought to know. 
What I'd like to know is how you... Dinner is served, Mrs. Livingston. May I take you into dinner, Miss Robinson? Thank you very much. <laughs> Sixty thousand pounds in my house, on her neck. There was no doubt about it, Edith's party was already a huge success. And Count Borselli deserved all the credit. His astonishing appraisal of Miss Robinson's string of pearls sparked a conversational fire which raged rampant throughout dinner and continued undiminished afterwards. And if she's stolen them, she'd hardly wear them in public. All the work of the governess. I just can't explain it. My dear, isn't it obvious? I watched her closely all through dinner. Nobility. Nobility? You really think so? Of course! In impoverished aristocracy, working incognito, gently hanging on to the last vestige of her former life. Oh, it hardly seems possible, and yet... Now that I think of it, the girl's nose is rather Romanoff. Well, I couldn't agree with it at all. Not at all, Della. As a matter of fact, her, her likeness to the to the Austrian branch of the Habsburgs is, is simply amazing. <laughs> I should know. I saw a great deal of the Duchess of Freisberg that, that summer of 25 in Vienna. I could tell you a few things about Lil. Yes, dear, <laughs> we know. But the girl has no accent. My dear, with their education, they never do. As I was going to say, I met her, I met her aunt that year. Her aunt? Yes, the Empress Federica, of course. Spoke the most beautiful English and, and was famous for her pearls, not to mention... Oh, I can't for Sally tell us. What is your opinion? I... I should say that she was... she was English. English? Well, there is the English type found in the Hess-Battenberg line of the German Duchy of South oh. <laughs> Prince Albert's family, of course. Great Scots, I, I believe you hit it. Imagine, right in your own house, Edith. Well, she did have awfully good references. How oh, brave. To keep the pearls, despite her difficulties, Think of her feeling for them. Well, think of Peter's feeling for them. He'd be out there in the garden that girl over half an hour. <laughs> Isn't it romantic? As the evening wore on, it did seem as though we were all in on the birth of a romance. The continued absence of Joan and Peter left no question about that. The only question remaining was, when was Colonel Mornay going to run out of Kipling ballads? Good night, Miss Robinson. It's been a great pleasure to meet you. Well, must you go so soon? Alas, yes. It is already past midnight, you know. Past midnight. How wonderful. What is so wonderful? Well, here I am, and I still haven't turned into a pumpkin. <laughs> it's been such a lovely party, Mrs. Livingston. Glad you enjoyed it, darling. And if you're too tired, don't give a thought to the children tomorrow. I'll have one of the maids take them to the park. Good for you, Mrs. Livingston. Then uh, may I call on you tomorrow, Joan? Well, I... But if it's all right. Oh, but of course. Do come, Peter. Well... Good night, Mrs. Livingston. Oh, Count Borselli, must you go? Mrs. Livingston, this has been a most enjoyable evening for me. It must have seemed quite like a busman's holiday to you, Count, discovering those pearls. Ah, yes, the pearls. But then, their great value is only a faithful reflection of the lady who wears them. Yes. Good night, Mrs. Livingston. May as well be having lunch alone. A million miles away, Joan. What happened last night? Oh, I'm sorry about that, Robert. You don't look too sorry. Well, I didn't want to break our date, but... Well, Mrs. Livingston asked me to do her a favor. She gave her? Oh, now, Robert, don't be silly. Matter of fact, I had a wonderful time. You won't believe this, Robert, but there was a man there. A Count Borselli. Count? And you know, the most curious thing happened. Look, Joan. Don't let these snobs turn your head. Robert, why are you so cross today? I'm only trying to tell you I had a most lovely evening. And I thought you might be interested to hear about it. I can't quite explain it, but... Then let's forget about it. Look, Joni, don't change. I like you the way you are. Pick you up at 7.30 tonight. Movies? Well, I'm sorry, but I can't. Why? Well, I'm going out with a young man who was at the party. Oh, so that's it. Well, if you prefer that type to me, I, I suppose it's your own affair. If you want to go out with somebody, somebody you've only met for five minutes, well, it's up to you, I suppose. Robert, I've never seen you act like this before. You're green-eyed with jealousy. Jealous? Me jealous of, of somebody like... Oh. <laughs> May I 
assist you, madam? Well, I wondered if I might have these appraised. Why? Well, I wanted to know. But they're nothing. They're not worth 15 shillings. Yes, that's what I thought. That's just about what I paid for them. Well, then why did you ask me? I wanted to be sure. And now I don't understand it at all. After that surprising evening at Mrs. Livingston's, Joan Robinson began to lead a charmed life. To the sentimental admiration of everyone, she kept her position as governess in the Livingston household, although she was invited everywhere. Joan was a smashing social success. She was rushed in the grand manner by all the eligibles, but it was Peter Jeffries in the lead all the way. As for Joan herself, she took it in her graceful stride. If it were really all a dream, she had obviously decided to enjoy it to the fullest. And after all, Peter Jeffries was real. Do you believe in stars, Peter? I don't see any at the moment. But I have a notion they're still up there. Oh, I don't mean that. I mean, do you believe they have something to do with our lives? I don't know. I never got in much for that sort of thing. Neither have I. But after what's happened to me, I'm beginning to wonder. What's happened to you? You know, somebody couldn't come to dinner, and I wore a string of beads, and... Well, look what happened. You still haven't told me what? Everything. That includes me? Of course. Most of all. Darling, that made everything perfect. What was wrong before? Except for the fact I hadn't kissed her yet. And that was something I was leading up to cautiously. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't that. You'll think I'm very silly. But every time I've seen you since the first, I've worn the beads except today. And I've been worried about this ever since I discovered I didn't have them on. What have the beads got to do with us? Well, I'm, I'm not really superstitious, but they must have a magic. They changed everything. I'd understand if they were really worth all that money, Peter, but you know they're just an ordinary string of beads. Yes, I know, darling. And as I've told you, it doesn't matter to me whether they're worth one shilling or a million pounds. They're precious because you're precious. You see, that's what I meant. They do have a magic. I've never met anyone like you, Joan. You're a storybook girl. No, no story. I'm just me, Joan Robinson. I keep wondering what you must have been like as a child, and I think I know, if I'm right. You lived in a very large house with many rooms and long, dark corridors. And although there are many people around you, you're always alone. How did you know? I didn't. But it's not too difficult to imagine what it must be like to be a little princess in a gloomy castle. <laughs> you're very sweet, Peter, but you're all wrong. Even though I did live in a large house with many rooms and dark corridors and lots of people, and I was always lonely. But you could never have called Dunbridge Orphanage a castle. Orphanage? Until I was 16. Well, if that's your story, you were right to it. Sorry, Pete. I'm not a woman with a past, but I am a woman with a job. Oh, don't go. Oh, I really must. Mrs. Livingston's been very sweet, but I don't like to take advantage. Anyway, I should get back to the children's baths and supper, especially if we're going to the theater tonight. I must say, I admire you. The way you're carrying it off. What do you mean? All right, all right, let it drop. You're plain, ordinary, everyday Joan Robinson. But if this is magic, I'm under the spell myself. Bye. Joan! Oh, Papa, you startled me. I did, did I? Well, let me tell you something. I'm not half as surprised as you are. I could see the whole thing in your face the day of that party. Stop it, let go of me. You have no right to talk to me like this. That's right. I haven't any right. 
And what's more, I don't want that right. Look, Robert, can't we talk about this some other time? There I... isn't going to be any other time for you and me. <laughs> You've got yourself a proper playmate now, Mr. Fancy Pants. Really, there's no need to be offensive. I'm sorry for you, Joan. But I'm glad for me, because I wanted a girl to settle down. That isn't grabbing for more than she's got. I hate to hear you talk like this, Robert. We've been friends for so long, and... I hate to see you play the fool. Oh, look, Joan, you're a nice kid, but you're reaching far beyond your class, and one of these days you're going to come a cropper before you know it. And when you do, maybe that'll bring you back to your senses. If that happens, let me know. moment, if you please, Miss Robinson. Yes, Mr. Livingston. Well, after all I've done for you. I don't know what you're talking about. Don't you, indeed? Well, perhaps you'll understand this. You're discharged, Miss Robinson, and without a reference. But why? What have I done? Of all the cheap, devious tricks, deliberately letting me think what you wanted me to think. Think what? I had a man out here from Brandon's today to design a new clip for me. I thought he might be interested in seeing your precious pearls. You mean you went into my room? He laughed at me. Not worth 15 shillings, he said. Not 15 shillings! And you knew it all the time. I never said they were worth anything. With every look, every gesture, you made us think you were nobility. Nobility? Impoverished but gallant, hanging on to your last heirloom, worth 60,000 pounds. I never said that. Camposelli did. Oh, just wait until Camposelli hears about this. You're a little cheap, that's what you are. And I'll expose you. I'll tell him everything. You won't have to, Mrs. Livingston. I'll tell him myself. And despite the fact that I told the truth, everybody believed you. And because they did, it, it was assumed that I was something that I wasn't and never pretended to be. Now they call me a cheat and a liar. Who cheated? Who lied? You knew there were just an ordinary string of beads, Camposelli. I don't know why you did it. It doesn't matter now, but you must be very satisfied. Your hopes was a huge success. Miss Robinson, just a moment. No. Please. All right. Why did you do it? A uh, whim, if you will. The party seemed dull, the people pretentious. And their attitude toward you left much to be desired. And your attitude towards me, was that any better? If it was such a good joke, couldn't you let me in on it? Perhaps I might have enjoyed it, too. You seem to be enjoying yourself very much that evening, Miss Robinson. We both knew it was an illusion, didn't we? But then, what else is happening? And now you're furious with me. Ah, well. I wish I could undo the mischief. I shall, of course, explain everything to Mrs. Livingstone. It's a little late for explanation. Well, then, at least let me make some small reparation by asking you out to dinner tonight. Thank you very much. I already have an invitation for tonight. Goodbye, Camposelli. Oh, Peter, I'm so glad you're here. Where else should I be? <laughs> I must say, darling, your call was very mysterious. Why Claridge's? I'd planned we'd dine at the Empire Room, and then we... Well, you're not dressed for the theater. Peter, I've been fired. Good. But have a drink to that. It relieves an awkward situation, you know. Very gallant in all of you, but really unnecessary under the circumstances. The circumstances are why I was fired. Darling, don't give it another thought. It's not worth it. But I have to think about it. What am I going to do now? Marry me. Oh, Peter, darling. Well, I'll admit it's a reckless move, financially speaking. But perhaps we could pool our resources and honeymoon in beer ritz for a month or two and... Well, after that, uh, something's bound to turn up. I haven't even accepted you yet, and we're already in beer ritz. Well, I haven't much to contribute to the pool. Small wardrobe, shelf of books, not... Don't forget the famous pearls. Oh, yes. They might buy us a cup of coffee. Not that I'd want you to get rid of them, Joan. I know how you feel about them. They must mean a great deal to you. I wish I'd never bought them. Well, of course... You, you bought them? Yes. I wish there'd never been a Count Borselli, either. Oh, wait. <laughs> Too fast, Joan. Uh, wh what about uh, Count Borselli? You know. You were there. But then if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have met you. And that was worth a lot more than 15 shillings. 15 shillings? But... Poor Silly's an authority. He also likes to have his bit of fun at other people's expense. Fun? And 
You mean the pearls are really only worth 15 shillings, huh? <laughs> yes, that's very funny. Upon <laughs> my soul, Edith must be in a state of coma. <laughs> well, Peter, it really isn't that funny. <laughs> Joan, you mean all that poppycock about the orphanage was true? Of course. Didn't you believe me? Well, well, Joan, after all... You, you didn't believe me. Then why didn't you say so? My dear, if nothing else, I hope I'm always a gentleman. If a lady chooses to tell a fanciful tale about her past, I'm certainly not going to contradict her. Look, Joan, I'm sorry I laughed out of turn. I know how you must feel. It's all utterly ridiculous, and Borselli should be put on the rack for a trick like that. But imagine me, taken in like all the rest. No, Peter. The only one who was really taken in was me. the Livingston residence. Whom did you... Oh, it's you. But you know exactly how I feel. Well, there's no need to apologize. You obviously meant what you said. But what more is there to say after what's happened? But apparently there was a great deal more to say because it was a fairly long telephone call. And a very important one, too. It's what is sometimes known as the 11th hour reprieve. Of course, that all depends on what you call a reprieve. Uh, waiter. I'm not moving from this spot till you finish your story. Oh, but I have. Obviously, she married him. A trite, happy ending. It's only the unhappy stories that are worthy of comment. Which man? You mean to say you don't know which man it was? Well, Peter wasn't a bad sort, really. And after all, he did propose. But then a steady fellow, that Robert. He was right. He called the turn on her, but... Uh, Laura. There's your answer. How for stay? Well, after all, he started it. I suppose he gave you the pearl she's wearing as a wedding gift? No, it's the same ordinary string of beads that started it all. She's rarely seen without them. Of course, their value has increased enormously if you measure it by the happiness they brought her. You see, Laura... All value is relative. Fame, fortune. Yes, so that's the answer. To what? Well, to the question you asked me half an hour ago. What does it feel like to be famous? I couldn't think of a reply at the time, but now I have it. It's like having a string of pearls given you. It's nice. But after a while, if you think of it at all, it's only to wonder if they're real or cultured. Let's go, shall we?